Okay, good afternoon, everybody. I think we're all here. Uh, welcome and thank you for joining us for our eighth webinar in our ongoing series at Lab Central Innovation and Biotech in the time of COVID-19. I'm Johannes Freehoff, CEO and founder of Lab Central, and I'm thrilled to be joined today by a panel of outstanding industry leaders who can be seen on this slide. Uh, on our top left, we have Cerise Marcella, who's Senior Manager at CBRE, and she's an expert in workplace uh, strategy. And uh, since we are all changing the way that we think about and work in offices, uh, uh, Cerise has great perspective to add to that, and we look forward to the discussion with you. Uh, Juliette Reiter is uh, an experienced uh, broker in our biotech community, and, and Juliet and her team have helped us through many years uh, to find real estate, including this one that we're in at Lab Central here. And so uh, she and her team uh, are deeply embedded in, in the reality of the, of the biotech market around uh, Cambridge and, and surrounding areas. And last but not least, Cameron Tavangar, who is a co-founder and chief operating officer at Affinivax, one of our Lab Central startups uh, working on vaccines for uh, pneumococcus, but now more recently also pivoted and added a program for uh, coronavirus. Uh, so we're grateful for that and we wish you luck with that, Cameron. But Cameron is here uh, today uh, because they are a rapidly growing company and, and a very good example of, of one of our users needing to solve the real estate problem and looking to experts uh, to, to help solve this. With that, let's get started. And maybe my first question to you, Cameron, uh, maybe describe for our audience a little bit the reality of who, who Affinivax is right now. How many people do you have? Uh, how is your space set up so far? And I know that you have been working to build out your new home, your new lab and office for the company to finally bring your groups together. Um, how has how have you responded to the crisis so far and, and what has it done to your plans there? Yeah, thank you, Johannes, and good afternoon to everybody. Um, so yes, I, I work at Affinivax. We've been now six years uh, as a company and have grown to about 75 people. And we're in four different sites right now and we will be moving into our own site uh, near the end of this year all here in Cambridge. So we've had a, a very strong growth over the last few years. And we've been thinking that our biggest challenge was going to be a move. And then of course, uh, the COVID-19 pandemic occurred. And um, there's a lot of uh, challenges that come with all of that as well. I should preface, of course, that uh, what we're going to talk about in terms of challenges is really nothing compared to what's happening in society. But um, you know, having said that, I think uh, with the COVID-19, what we had to do very quickly was uh, to go into a rotation schedule and um, a daily email to our Affinivax colleagues with the best updates that we could give them. We are lucky that our scientific founder is an infectious disease expert. So we were able to have uh, the, the best scientific information as it was happening provide that information to our colleagues uh, on a daily basis in the beginning and then moved to a weekly town hall, which continues today. But you know, the, the challenges that we faced, of course, were how do you make sure that your uh, employees are safe, but also how do you ensure that they are comfortable to come to work? Um, so we, we provided the opportunity for people to work from home if they were uncomfortable to come to work we said really there's no issue with not coming to work and there's no brownie points for coming to work. It's just, you know, we're all working together. Uh, there is a responsibility that comes from being an exempt um, business. So we are very lucky in that sense that we're able to keep everybody employed. Um, and it gives us an additional responsibility to do everything we can on, on the research front to, to be able to move the science forward. So there was a lot of different balancing acts that we had to do, uh, a lot of rotation schedules uh, down to the hour sometimes so that we could make sure that population density was controlled. For some people, 
the definition of population density was different from person to person. Generally speaking, uh, we, we wanted to make sure that everybody was comfortable, but also at the individual person level, we also wanted to make sure that each person was comfortable. So quite a bit of uh, logistics uh, in the beginning, um, just to get uh, the ball rolling while we were also trying to get ready for a move. Have you, have you been able to see any productivity out of your team? Uh, with all of the you? team, I, I have to say the team has gone above and beyond anything one can imagine. Uh, truly, have all stepped up, uh, all doing their part. We we remain um, on our milestones. Um, people are working. Some some people are working on evenings. Some people are working weekends, and everybody stepping in and doing what they can um, for this process. Yeah. Thank you, Carmen. Cerise, your specialty is how to arrange workplaces to be optimal for the needs that people have. And I imagine that your head must start to explode when you hear all of the rules that are being put in place right now. How has your own office responded uh, to, to this? And, and do, you, do you see your clients that you advise respond similar as, uh, similarly to what Cameron has described right now? Yeah, absolutely. I think the, the first question is that, you know, we, we all really want to be back in the office at some point and have that new normal. Um, however, how do we do it in a way that it's responsible? And I think as a company, very similarly across the board, we're seeing that people are taking this very conservatively. It's pretty much an opt-in basis if you feel comfortable to come to the office um, while still complying with that minimum, you know, maximum number of people in the office itself. Uh, but really, the challenge really becomes how do you really manage like the two, the dual population when you have people working in the office, but also working from home, establishing a culture that can still be a cohesive unit um, as a community. Um, so I think I love that, Kamran, you talk about having that town hall weekly, right? Having that update at this point, communication is very crucial that at this point, over communicating is much better than kind of holding off and making sure you're kind of saying the right things. Um, so I think over the board, just like increasing that level of communication and intensity of, of open line communications with regard to reopening of the office is what we're seeing. What are the tools that you recommend people use for that? Is it is it um, meetings in with, with distance or is it Zoom meetings or are there any best practices that you've seen? Yeah, uh, I think we're actually really fortunate that uh, right now we have so many different technology tools from Slack, from Teams, Zoom calls. I think if this were happened 10 years ago, I don't think we can actually sustain the productivity that the level that we are um, today. Um, so we actually are seeing how these different technology tools are used differently. So not only using the meetings as part of that forum for people to share, but establishing new norms of the team. Do you have lunch together? Just have Zoom calls turning on and have to have that face-to-face -face connection during the day. Um, there's just different ways how teams have been creatively using these technology tools to establish that new um, digital um, experience of the workplace um, these days. Juliet, I know that you work with many companies looking for space in Cambridge and, and in the larger greater Boston areas. Many of our companies that are coming out of Lab Central turn to you for guidance and advice. Um, of course, what Cerise is mentioning, the culture piece is a very important one for our innovative companies. Are you, are you helping them integrate this? How, how are company resp companies responding to this uncertainty that's there? Um, and, and, and what are you, how are you helping them find space in this world? Yeah. Well, thanks, Johannes, and, and good afternoon, everybody. Um, we are indeed keeping very busy, as many of our clients are very eager um, and excited to go back to their offices and to their labs, particularly their labs, because unlike um, the office environment and the general administration type of work, those functions actually can't be done at home. Um, so they are planning on, on continuing their searches and looking to, to, to get up and running in their labs as soon as safely possible. Many of the properties that we tour these days are vacant as you would expect and we walk through them and we see desks um, pushed together and chairs 
four feet apart. And we all sort of look at each other from a distance with our masks on and says, you know what, this space can work, but clearly we're gonna have to make a number of modifications to it in order for us to feel comfortable in order to comply with the regulations and also to be safe. Um, so I would say that we're planning, we're doing lots of analyses, doing lots of um, a, a working with many existing companies as well to help them get back into their, to their offices, into their labs by sort of identifying um, danger zones within their offices and their labs and places where people congregate and working on strategies to be able to get them to come back, but at a distance. I'd love to hear how in, in these discussions that you have with, with clients now, how this new reality is influencing their search for space. Uh, one observation that we had had previously is that all of our companies are lab-based companies, right? So they all need lab space as well. At the same time, much of the work that they're doing in the lab has become so efficient that the lab portion of the overall footprint is, is shrinking while the data analysis is more relevant and so we've been looking to build labs that are or spaces that are 30 labs 70 office uh are you seeing people shift uh already in in a in a response to this right now is this already is this new reality already influencing the way that people look at cho choosing their space i think it's still early um we are having lots of conversations about what functions can be automated in order to reduce the number of people in a lab at any given time um, and then just in general about sort of spacing and proportions of office to lab and number of people in a facility. I think for every organization that we speak to that says that we never need to bring our office um, personnel back, we can do these functions remotely or, or, or in an automated fashion, there's another one that says we are coming back and we're gonna take more space to allow people to have more space so we can put more people be back together um, both in the office and in the labs. So it's, it's evolving um, sort of in real time and there really isn't one obvious trend that we're seeing yet to, to, to determine whether or not the office to lab ratio is going to shift. Do you think that the, I think this is again for Juliet, um, the, the suburban market could become more attractive as compared to our high density Kendall Square environments given these new realities? Is that something that you're seeing trends? So again, it's early. The suburbs have been a conversation, part of the conversation that we've had for the last 15 to 20 years. I mean, it's a very, very common analysis that we do, Cambridge versus the suburbs. And most companies that look in Cambridge or even know that they're going to lease space in Cambridge say, you know what, let's do our homework, let's get educated on what it feels like to work in a single story suburban office park where everybody drives and where the rent is typically more favorable for the tenant. So that's an analysis that we've been doing for a long time. Is it going to change? Are people going to um, say, you know what, let's, let's leave the urban hotspots, let's leave the seaport, let's leave Kendall Square and go to the suburbs. I think it's too early to say. Um, I will say that there are a number of companies that are thriving um, and I would feel very, very good about being an owner of, of laboratory real estate in the suburbs right now, given the number of companies that have relocated, not due to COVID, but just over the years as companies have matured and as those, those clusters have become um, more established and as the, the actual physical infrastructure of the buildings has become um, far and far improved versus what, what, what the inventory used to be. So I think companies will certainly consider it. I think there'll always be a group that will go out there um, and there are some companies that, that will well, that will never leave. I mean, Cameron's a good example. He, he knew all the advantages. We spent a lot of time going back and forth at Cambridge, the suburbs, and he was going to stay in Cambridge, and he did. And it took a long time, and it was it was a battle. But there are many companies for for a lot of good reasons that I think are always that are always going to say. And the biggest last comment on that, I think, is what the new idea about the suburbs is really going to be the transportation. Is is, is how comfortable are people on public transportation? If people are um, concerned and if there are legitimate safety concerns going forward that can't get resolved. People driving to work, um, I think might, will put the suburbs in a, in a more favorable spot even than they are today. So. Carmen, do you want to comment on your decision-making and journey? This was pre-COVID though. 
Yeah, I think I think uh, Juliet brought up all the, the the key points. I think for us the key was that there's a there's a vibrancy in Cambridge that's just very hard to replicate anywhere else. Uh, I would dare say in the world, uh, it's it's a it's a very small uh, square footage here in Cambridge that is just packed with a lot of uh, industry, and we we thrive on it. We thrive on the the day-to-day -day, uh when you walk out into the the streets of cambridge there's always just a lot of activity a lot of science going on there's restaurants there's cafes uh, there's public transit and for, for us all of those things are very important and the the uh, employee base that we have the vast majority of them use public transit now of course COVID has has put some <laughs> dampers on all this but if we put that aside for a minute um, between you know, bikes and skateboards and, and buses and, and uh, um, the, the tea, I think, you know, the vast majority, and walking, actually walking, uh, a lot of people walk to work. That's, that's something that's very difficult to replicate anywhere else. Um, and we, we, yeah, we were Cambridge snobs. We, we, we have, um, I think Juliet wanted to show us a number of places, and I think we went and saw a number of places. But at the end of the day, for us, for Affinivax, the decision was much more, uh, it was important for staying to stay in the Cambridge area. And we were lucky actually to find a place. And I say lucky, even though it's much, much more expensive here, much more difficult to find a place, but we were able to find a place. Um, and then, you know, we're actually building it out brand new, learning from Lab Central and learning from Cambridge Innovation Center and other places that are all right here in Cambridge. Um, a lot about population flow, common areas, office areas, lab areas, equipment, a lot of things that we all face. One of the nice things about being here in Cambridge is everybody's here too. So we can talk to each other. Even with masks on, you can still talk to each other. So uh, it's been very, very helpful from that angle to try to stay in the Cambridge area. Yeah, thank you, Cameron. You're describing what, what has kept me here, right, is, is this fabulous environment of I walk down Main Street and I meet like 10 people on my way from here to one Broadway that I know and that I can have a conversation with. And in a way, we've, we've tried to distill that into the lab central facilities and biolab facilities that we're building, where we have all the functions that people need to do their work and to but also to meet outside of work and eat together and have a coffee together and and have this exchange which i believe is so crucial such a crucial element to the innovation that that we all sort of living for Cerise, you must be thinking about that a lot uh, um, how can we build workplace environments and now the lab is one part but the regular office where people are supposed to meet and exchange ideas um, how are we going to make that a place that exists again and, and, and where we can have, you know, free flowing exchange of ideas that is not just structured in a Zoom call where we have agenda item one, two and three that we go through and after that we log off and go to the next call. Yeah, yeah. What's really interesting about this whole migration to Zoom and then coming back to work is that you know, a lot of the studies, the biggest challenge that we found how people working from home is that the lack of motivation and that idea of like sense of connection to the colleagues, but also to the mission of the company, because sometimes we say out of sight, out of mind, right? Like the idea of coming back to the office, um, there's a lot of eagerness and excitement. And um, I think bringing it back, kind of having that transitional moment that, you know, having that familiarity again back in the office, um, especially as we start seeing a lot of the states are starting to reopen, I think there'll be this newly kind of new adoption of seeing more people being more open, um, especially after being three months um, kind of in the at home, now having this type of interaction. Um, definitely the interaction will change, but I think some of the communication and trainings that we start to help our clients to think about what, what does that culture guidelines look like in the future? How do we retell that story again, that, you know, the sense of place, the sense of connection in the office? Um, and part of it is that reestablishing what that new culture for your team is going to look like. 
um, what is acceptable, what what are the type of norms and rituals and traditions that we do. And I think that what makes office is the intangible of the offices that makes office an exciting place to be. Um, because for the most part, before this pre-COVID, the idea of exploring flexibility, there's an expectation of people to be in the office. I think all of that barriers have been removed because everyone who felt like you can't work in, you know, outside of the office now felt that, okay, I, I'm actually finding that productivity. So I think that role of office will even evolve that as opposed to just thinking about, oh, I'm going to have my focus has down type of work in the office it really becomes a like, place of, you know, renewed sense of meaning and connection and, you know, being out there with people. I, I read um, the forecast doom of commercial real estate um, because the, the work from home ability makes, in a way, makes this world flat, right? And you don't have to now live or be in Kendall Square to be a productive employee of one of these uh, very innovative companies. And if you take that to the next, yeah, currently most of the employees are hunkering down in their homes in Brookline and Newton and, and calling in from there, but you could equally well be sitting in much cheaper areas and, and collect a nice salary because you're employed here. And so is that going to create uh, overall less demand for the office. What, what are professionals thinking around that? Are you, are you uh, getting out of the real estate business because of that? <laughs> um, we are hearing, so for instance, Twitter and Facebook already said, like, we're going to think about this as our long-term strategy. Twitter goes even further. We're going to allow any employee to choose to work permanently from home because we know that they can still be productive. Facebook actually took the opposite route and say, if you are moving to lower cost um, areas, maybe you should take a pay cut on your salaries because it's kind of proportional to where you live. Um, but I think it's, it's very controversial all across the board. I think those are kind of the pioneer quote unquote out there to make that bold decision. Um, I do think that for the most part, now that people have been working from home, I think there will be openness for companies to allow that in the future. Now, we're not saying that it will be a remote worker per se, but maybe allowing employees to work one to two days a week. We did a survey in the Boston market, and I think for the most part, more than half people think that they can be working from home one to two days a week in the future, pre-vaccine and potentially post-vaccine as well. And that tells something that People want to be working outside. Now, when we see the balance of the workplace, we're seeing that, okay, we shouldn't densify more because what if something like this happens again and we have to see what is our proportion of square foot per person? So I think there's a balance of maybe we don't densify even further, but with that lower utilization, maybe there might be a notion of sharing. And I think the jury saw out how does that really impact the overall demand of real estate um, moving forward. Cameron, you mentioned that, of course, your company is founded or co-founded by an infectious disease expert. And that, so that means you have your internal assessment and intelligence on what makes sense of, to keep your team safe. And uh, how are you, how have you responded? Maybe tell us a little bit about sort of the thinking that went into that. Um, and, and are you seeing the government mandated regulations to fall in line with, with what you had decided internally or do they go further or don't they go as far? Because um, I think that uh, we, we want to, of course, be in compliance with the government at the same time. We want to hear from the best uh, scientists as to what is the current science recommending us. Yeah, it's a great, it's a great point, Johannes. I think when we first um, we're faced with a situation, we said, you know, we have to go with, with the CDC guidelines. And generally speaking, we have to know what the federal guidelines are, the state guidelines are, and the local guidelines are. And then as a company, take the most conservative of those guidelines as our guideline. Uh, so if there's any kind of conflict between guidelines, just take the one that is the most conservative and safest for our employees as our way of doing it. Because of course we can't just be rogue as well, uh, as well right? So it, it, was a, it was a process of 
having our scientific founder essentially explain to us daily and then weekly, um, what are the CDC guidelines? How have they changed? Uh, what's happened in the Massachusetts side? What, is there anything local that we need to worry about? And then on any kind of, uh, let's say, evolving area in science uh, where there wasn't any guideline, the best, best estimate from our infectious disease expert as to what would be the most conservative way to look, look at the situation. So our approach was one of communication. We have a very extensive Q&A document that we put together that uh, became a living document in the first three weeks, changing constantly, and now has sort of uh, died down a little bit. But in the, in the early days, you know, everybody had an opinion and everybody um, was very concerned, you know, fear of the unknown. So it was really a, about communication of the CDC guidelines in particular. And um, when it came to uh, thinking through about, well, how will we react to society opening back up, we again will take the same conservative approach that as long as we feel that uh, the safety of our employees are, is not compromised, we're happy to move forward with the guideline. I don't think anybody will fault us for staying more conservative than a guideline. At some point, the guideline may keep you from being as productive as you could be, but I understand that you need to be uh, conservative and you need to keep your people safe. Uh, yeah, and, we, I mean, and it, this is going to sound, I don't know what it's going to sound like, but we said from the very beginning that all the milestones are out the door. Forget it. Uh, first step is employee safety. Let's, let's work together. And, and if the milestones fall apart, they fall apart. Now, that coming from a type A plus personality like me was a surprise, but you know, at the end of the day, it doesn't matter, right? So, so what? Six month delay, what are you gonna do? So I think that took a lot of the pressure off, but I have to say that the, the way in which then our employee base responded has been exemplary. And we are maintaining most of our timelines and the ones that we can't, it's okay, it happens. One, one question I think that I, I'd love to, hear all of your input on, uh, touches the commute. And of course, especially, I mean, Juliet mentioned if we are in the suburb, it's fine. Everybody is gonna be driving their cars to the parking lot and walk over to the office. Uh, but for places like here and uh, Cameron's new home and, and other places around Kendall, that's really hard. Uh, parking is crazy expensive if you can even get parking. And in fact, many of our employees, and that's why we locate our companies here, don't have cars and don't want to drive cars. Um, what are you seeing uh, in, how, how do you see the, the commute evolve and, and um, how are you counseling your clients on that one? Julia. One of the things that we're seeing as it relates to, to parking, working with a company right now who recently opened um, a biotech company and they're off, their hours are six to 12, Monday to Saturday. So the parking spaces are actually being shared when com one employee comes in at some point and when that person's not there, the other person has, has the space. So we're seeing certainly a sharing, we're seeing the work day and the work week changing very, very much from a typical eight in the morning till six at night. It's becoming, it's changing and, it, and people, it's adapting to, to the, to the personnel who do their work whenever they can do their work when they take into consideration the other things going on in their in, in their lives, their families, their the the the, the COVID situation, etc. Um, so I think the way people share their parking spaces is, is going to change, and and I'm I'm as a I'm a personal proponent of of. of and always enjoyed riding the T and seeing people and taking the walk from the Kendall Square T station down to Lab Central. I always enjoyed that and, and hopeful that I can do that again too and not have to take my car for little trips. So I'm, 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 I'm optimistic um, that, that with mass and, and improvements on the MBTA and, and, and other modes that we will be able to use public transportation again in some form that, that makes people comfortable and that's safe and that gets us where we need to go. Are your offices studying measures that other cities are implementing for their public transportation? W what are measures that, that the T could adapt that would make us not only feel good, but also be safe in there? 
Yes, you know, some of the thing, I mean, Boston's hard because the system's so old, it's so compact. I mean, Boston has a, a lot of a lot of challenges, but I think some of the obvious ones are the way the drivers are isolated on the bus, having people that are indoors and outdoors, a limited number of capacities in the actual cars or on the buses. Um, but this is all unfolding real time as well with people really just going back in earnest and earnest being what, 25% starting this week. So we'll have to see lots of cleaning measures as well, sanitation measures um, to make sure that. Yeah. Sarisa, are you watching that? Yeah, yeah, I think that I think that's totally right, right? With the 25%, we shouldn't impact that high of a peak of the um, conversion from the public transit riders to people driving. I think we're seeing that same strategy of um, having shared parking spots. Um, I think when, when it comes to people's um, perception of walking to work and biking to work, you definitely are seeing that that kind of in the past, let's say you're thinking of 20 minutes to come to work, you would walk. I think that will get extended, um, just like people's behavior, understanding that. There's an interesting study um, done by Vanderbilt University to start modeling what is that kind of conversion from um, commuters to riders carpool into single um, cars look like for the major cities. Um, they're looking at Boston. We're seeing an increase of about um, five minutes round trip, which is, you know, it's, it's a lot. But I think at the same time, um, they're not really they're, they're assessing that it won't be a huge increase, especially with the percentage of job loss remote work participants, the capacity that we are looking at. Um, so I think for the most part, um, we're saying it's still, we're still within the available supply of parking spots in Boston um, in particular. We, we are coming up on the 10 minutes to the end of our call and we have a number of uh, questions coming in uh, from the audience. Uh, one is the uh, I, I, let me just read it to you. Um, the days of open office space are over. I don't know if that's true, but that's what the questioner is, is claiming, at least for now. Are you seeing any innovations in the office furniture suppliers and cubicle manufacturers, etc.? Anyone can jump in here. Uh, I, how do you see, how do you see, I mean, first of all, do you agree with that statement? The day of the open office are over. Are we going back to 1980s style cube farms, yuck, I don't want to. But what are you seeing in the, in the furniture market? So I can start um, because we, we have this yeah. issue today, right? Um, yeah. All we do is worry about these things for our new facility. I think the, the, the thought is that we need some sort of a physical barrier that can be removed. So, um, so I, don't think the, I don't think the situation is gonna last year after year after year. So we can't, we, I don't think we're going to go back to the, the you know, mausoleum type um, offices where you close the door and you can't hear a single thing outside anymore. Um, I, and there's no need for it in my mind. I think we can, we, can, um, we can achieve what we need to achieve through population density measures uh, and, and the work from home aspect and the, the, the virtual meeting aspect, all these things we're learning as we go. I mean, it's the first time we're all facing this. But we're learning that there's a lot of productivity that can be maintained through virtual things, um, but it's not going to replace the the common areas, the 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 open areas, the the traffic flows, and the communication that we need. So, in the temporary measure, we think we need to be able to set up uh, the the desks, the common area desks, in a way that some sort of a uh, barrier can be put in, some sort of plexiglass or something. Yes, it might be ugly, but so what? Um, and we'll take it away and we'll burn them later uh, when we can. Therese? I love that you're speaking my language, Cameron. I think that's exactly what we're seeing that, you know, it's not gonna be a reversion of something that we started to facilitate the past 10 years. Um, the open office dilemma has been starting even pre-COVID, right? With a lot of the articles that we're seeing the past year. Um, I think the perspective of, you know, let's redefine what that open office means. Are we saying just like open like a table with everyone's kind of surrounding it? I think the definition of the open office still needs to be redefined. I think especially in the area of the post-COVID world. 
um, we are seeing that um, providing more choices and flexibility becomes much more important than thinking about your space as that particular desk with the walls around surrounding it. Um, I think it, it kind of goes hand in hand. It can be controversial when I say that people are considering more of a shared type of desk environment. However, it does prove that with that level of democracy in the spaces, that it actually allows for people to choose the spaces that they need to make them feel more productive as opposed to just thinking about that space of that, however workstation footprint look like. So I think there will be a re redefinition of that open office work environment look like later on. More, more questions coming in here, uh, wild and furious. I, I don't think we can get to all of them. Here's a quick one, Juliet, for you. Will lab rents go up or down over the next six months? You know, so that's a question to you. People get that all the time. Uh, what's the market like? Are there more options? Is, are there good values now because of the situation? I would say that Kendall Square is as tight as it ever, as has ever been. Rents have not gone down um, for for laboratory space in and around uh, Cambridge, working on a, a piece of space that may or may not come to available. And right now, again, as, as even before COVID, it's a competitive environment with three great companies vying for a 20,000 square foot piece of, piece of space um, with a, a rent that would make any landlord very happy. So we haven't seen it yet. Um, where we are seeing a little bit of a softening and where we are expecting rents to decrease a little bit is with some office space potentially coming to market, subway space coming to market as a result of some of the changes, partic particularly in the technology industry, those organizations thinking that they can stay home, not needing as big of a footprint. So I think you could find some values in that market, but your Kendall Square 15K of 50-50 lab to office, no bargain. Another one, I think we touched on that a little bit already. Interested to hear if anyone is considering a distributed teams model or even relocating out of Boston to other hubs for better work-life balance. I, I wanna just answer to the question, don't move out of Boston. You're gonna lose more than you win and the virus is gonna hit you there just as badly as it does here. So let's not, let's not advertise any other geography as Boston. I, I just took that on myself. Um, here's another one for all of you. Um, Good one, I think. Uh, in terms of keeping everybody safe, and we talked about the uh, the commute, the building, many of our buildings are high rises and we have to ride elevators, which are confined and narrow spaces, and we need some safety around all of these areas. Is it the responsibility of the landlord or the tenant to provide control measures for COVID transmission in office spaces? What I don't know. What's the, are, are there any rules around that? I think it's evolving. I think it's the landlord. I think it's the tenant. I think it's the individual to, who decides to go to work only if and when they are able to, to do that. So I think it's a combined effort, much the way it's a combined effort to fight this with the national government, the, the local government, uh, and the individual. So I think it's a collective effort. Um, but elevators has been, we talk about elevators a lot too. I think as recently as this morning, someone said that if, that probably the max is gonna be four and it will be four people standing in the corners. But if we stick with that with masks and only have four at a time, we're probably good. The other thing regarding elevators that made me laugh as someone said that we should all carry Q-tips and we should press the button with a Q-tip and then we will be eliminating any sort of um, contact with the actual elevator buttons. That might be a bit extreme, but that was something that was mentioned on one of our- no, I was gonna ask stuff. you if, if it's four of us in the elevator, do we have to turn towards the corner or can we, <laughs> well, um, the, I, I believe that the mask uh, wearing is going to allow us to do many of these things relatively safely again. Cameron, do, from, a, from a scientific point of view, do you agree with that? Yes, I think, I think the, I mean, all the science that I've heard uh, would strongly suggest that the virus is really not airborne. Um, and it's, it's more through droplets than anything else. And the droplets fall within six feet, actually within three feet, and we double it to six feet. So if you're also wearing a mask, the probability of a droplet getting through your mask to somebody else is really, um, go, becomes really quite low. Uh, not impossible, of course, but very low. And so I think a combination of mask, the six foot distance, and just good hygiene is going to remain 
the 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 way to go probably for for a while to come you know another year and uh, I say another year without any hesitation because it doesn't mean we don't we won't open up society it just means we just have to be cognizant and careful that until we have immunity we just have to take some very small measures like put a mask on and and be be apart for six feet and it's okay don't shake hands you know wash your hands all the things that we've said uh, will will go a long way towards us going back to this new normal and having uh, interactions or sitting in, sitting you know sitting at outdoor areas together uh, working together and all of that I think as we as has been mentioned this is a lab-based business for us 90 percent of what we have to get done has to happen in the lab so all of these things have to become normal for us uh, for, for some time to come it in terms of going back to work uh, safely, uh, one of the measures that we've been trying to get our heads around is mass testing of people and for virus. But the, the, the easier way is to do temperature testing, of course. Do you, and, and that could be a thing that, that landlords or managers of large buildings do at the front gate. Uh, for the two of you, Juliet and Cerise, do you see that being implemented already, becoming mandatory uh, sometime soon? Or where, where are we going to go with temperature testing to begin with and later maybe virus testing? Yeah, we started to see that in a lot of the landlord-tenant discussions in terms of what can the landlord provide to the tenants? Can they actually do that at the front of the building because it may have more areas and it makes sense in terms of flow. Um, however, I think due to you know any risk associated with carrying that duties from the landlord perspective, I think we haven't seen it implemented where a landlord is doing it other than for those who are actually service personnel of the building where the landlord is responsible um, to make sure for those operators. Um, a lot of companies initially have explored the idea of temperature screening at every you know, checkpoint um, when people are coming to the office. However, across the board, we are seeing that people are putting it back on the responsibility of the employees to do that test. So the idea of screening um, point system that, you know, you, four hours before you come into the office, you have to fill out all this um, data points um, in terms of your temperature check at home before coming to the office is what we're seeing as the most, um, you know, common approach among companies. Um, okay. We, we are at the top of our time already. Uh, I want to wrap it up with this, saying that I, I do hope that we'll find as a scientific community solutions for this uh, that we'll offer back to uh, the real estate uh, uh, groups uh, so that we can go back to work safely and productively. I, I do think that rapid on-site testing can uh, play a part in that and we've had other discussions around that. Um, I want to thank you all three very much for joining on this panel. I think we this is a very valuable discussion for many of our companies who are looking to plan their next steps and um, maybe they can follow up with you directly also if they have uh, specific questions. Um, thanks again for joining us. Hope, hope you will be tuning in uh, again uh, next week, or I think in two weeks, we have our next panel where we're talking about company creation and technology transfer. And with that, I leave you back into the beautiful afternoon that is happening out there. Uh, go and get some sunlight. It's good against the virus. Thank you very much. Talk to you soon. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thank you.